The Lord be with you. This morning we are delighted to welcome the Concordia Symphony Orchestra from Concordia University, Irvine. They will be leading our singing this morning, accompanying both the liturgical music as well as our hymn for the day. We're also pleased to welcome the Reverend Dr. Stephen Miller as our preacher this morning. Immediately following the service, there will be a couple of minutes of transition, and then we will begin our after chapel concert. I invite you now to turn to page 235 in Lutheran Service Book for the Order of Morning Prayer. Please stand.
A reading from 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow morning. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. O Lord, have mercy on us.
In the name of Jesus, amen. Fresh from his victory over Baal at Mount Carmel, where Yahweh had exercised his power, Elijah must have been riding pretty high. God had acted, and the false God was shown for the empty image that he had been all along. Baal's prophets captured and killed such a mighty victory. And the Lord had worked through him, his prophet. And even then, rain fell after Baal had already failed, another sign of Yahweh's power and blessing. So what, I wonder, was Elijah thinking? Perhaps he had imaginations that the victory would continue. A religious reformation, a revival would take place. The hearts of the people would turn to God once more. But it didn't happen. Because victory in a battle does not necessarily mean that the war is over. Instead, when word reached Jezebel of what had happened, she pledged his death. Clearly, the situation had not changed as he would have hoped. And Elijah is crushed. What's more, he receives no direction from God on what to do next. Now, reading the text, it would appear that it did have a bigger impact than Elijah might have felt. Jezebel was able to send a message to him. She knew where he was, but only threatened him by the next day. Maybe she feared the people. Maybe Ahab had dissuaded her from acting hastily. But Elijah doesn't see the disconnect between her words and inaction. He only hears the threat. So what is the prophet to do? Reflect on the word of God already received? Pray earnestly for wisdom and direction. Wait patiently upon the Lord to guide? No. Brave Elijah, who faced down the prophets of Baal, who mocked their false god, the bold man who called down divine fire upon the soaking wet sacrifice, lost his courage. He could face down a god, but a living human queen was too much. He ran for his life, seeking refuge in the wilderness. And there, hidden underneath a small broom tree, he prayed for death. It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my fathers. Fear and exhaustion have taken their toll. Truly, if he wanted to die, why take the journey at all? He could have remained where he was and died the death of a martyr. But here he was, despondent, and with that prayer he fell asleep. Can we not sympathize with Elijah? Knowing the highs and lows of the Christian life, we certainly can understand feelings such as these when things do not go as we might hope. For we are all tempted, like Elijah, with a theology of glory. If only we are faithful, things should be easy. I am following God's call, so why is it so challenging? What seminarian has not been tempted with such thoughts? And how easily a pastor, a deaconess, and yes, even a professor, can find themselves in that self-pity and despair as if it is all up to them. And in the midst of a holy but oh-so-busy season, confronted by the pressures and challenges of ministry, and the cares of this life, even those who proclaim the mercies of God can lose sight of him and see only the struggle. When afflicted with such trials like Elijah, perhaps we too are inclined to think we are the only ones who feel this. And somehow in the midst of such struggle, somehow forget that our Lord has prepared us warning us that the faithful will see trouble in this world 
and calling us to take our cross daily and follow him. But instead of heeding his word, we cry out from our own broom trees, It is enough, O Lord. Take my life. And that is what happens when we turn our eyes from the Lord and put them on ourselves. But God does not lash out in righteous anger. No fire from heaven falls to consume Elijah, nor us. But in fatherly mercy, he provides. Elijah is awakened by an angel who gives him food and drink. And he rests again. And once more, the angel wakes him and feeds him. And rested by rested and nourished by these miraculous meals, Elijah rose and traveled for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb where God would speak with him and where he would finally be ready to listen. Now these wilderness meals were in fact miraculous. Even more their ability to sustain for such a lengthy journey. But are they not surpassed by miracles far greater. For another would be led into the wilderness, not in fear for his own life, but to seek the life of his people. He would endure for 40 days and 40 nights, receiving no food from the angels, instead being tempted to listen to Satan and provide it himself. He would wrestle not with an evil human queen, but with Satan and never give in, for he is the bread of life, the manna in the wilderness, the living water that truly satisfies. Nor would he flee when his life was threatened, but instead set his face like flint toward Jerusalem, where he would use his authority to lay down his life to redeem the fearful and the doubters the confused and the violent and the murderers and, yes, even the idolaters, any who would receive him. For in the wilderness we see the Lord's Christ, faithful in every way for you. The season of Lent and the ongoing Lent of life in this world may lead us feeling like Elijah, disappointed, fearful and alone, but we are not alone. Our Redeemer is always with us, and God provides. Perhaps you've seen the meme that's circulating around on this passage that concludes with the words, never underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and a snack. Now, of course, it trivializes this passage And yet this account does, in part, remind us of the need to make sure our needs are cared for, that we are fed and rested. To work, yes, but also to rest in our Lord. But far more than that, to rely on the God who promises to provide, to gratefully receive bread from his hand, and to recognize the people who love and uphold us. But above all, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. For man does not live by bread alone. We have something far greater. The bread of life come down from heaven to give life to the world. Bread that sustains not merely for 40 days, but to eternal life. So rise, eat, for the journey is too much for you, but not for your Lord. Rise, for he comes to you. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O merciful Father in heaven, from you comes all rule and authority over the nations of the world for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well. Graciously regard Joseph, our president, Michael, our governor, and all those who serve in the government of our nation. Enlighten and defend them in their work and grant them wisdom and understanding that we, your people, may be guarded and directed in righteousness, quietness, and unity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord God of infinite mercy, we humbly implore you to look down with mercy on Russia and Ukraine in this time of continued conflict. Do not count your people's sins against them, but grant them true repentance, that the lusts of the human heart may be conquered by your spirit of gentleness and righteousness. According to your good and gracious will, remove the causes and occasions of this conflict and restore peace among the nations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, hear those who cry out to you for help in their time of illness or suffering. Bless especially your servants, Ellery, Suzanne, Paula, Blake, Beth, and those whom we name now before you in our hearts. According to your good and gracious will, heal their infirmities or give them strength to bear all their crosses in Christian patience. Above all, sustain them in the faith that they may be comforted in the forgiveness, life, and salvation that you have given them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together the Collect for Grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Please be seated. As we transition to the after chapel concert, let me encourage all those who are staying to come forward and sit in the front pews. You'll have a better view of the orchestra or even over in the north transept if you like. And now I invite President Egger to come forward for a few words of welcome to our honored guests. 
The Lord be with you. Our Redeemer is indeed with us, and he will provide. Thank you to Dr. Mueller for his words of encouragement and strength in our Savior Christ Jesus this morning. And thank you to the Concordia Symphony Orchestra for beautifying our worship this morning and uh, helping us, helping to lead us in the liturgy. It's great to have you here. We thank God for the gift of music, and we are so thankful for the work of our Concordia Universities. Thank God for Concordia University Irvine, and my prayer for all of you uh, during your time at the university is that the Lord will be shaping your hearts and your lives in ways that lead you into paths of service that glorify Him and that serve His people well. And for those of you who are not Christians at the university, my prayer is that your time at Concordia University would be a time in which God would show you the great love and beauty and hope that he has brought into the world in his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being among us. Let's thank them for joining us. At this time, those of you who are unable to stay are uh, invited to leave quickly and quietly, and uh, the rest of us will remain for a performance of Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. There we go. Uh, good morning. Thank you um, for your warm welcome. It's truly an honor to be here at the seminary today. Um, I do want to mention that um, the, the new setting of the liturgy that was orchestrated, uh, it's from your own seminarian, Owen Duncan, uh, who is, well, you all probably remember what a great trombonist he is. He played in our orchestra for four years. And he's a very talented composer, and I know he's um, premiering a new hymn somewhere in the next week as well. Uh, so we wish his blessings on his ministry in Florida. I know he's watching right now. Um, but it was, it was really cool to be able to share his new music here at the seminary. And um, a welcome to, to another alumnus of this orchestra. Hello to an alumnus. I saw him a second ago. Justin, it's great to see you, man. So, we're going to uh, move on and uh, uh, welcome also, I see some other alumni like Dan and there may be some others here as well. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to present this piece for you. Uh, Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring, it's one of the most well-known pieces of classical music, but like many pieces of classical music, few have heard it in its entirety and you get that this morning. We have program notes for you, which you're welcome to read. Um, this is one of the great pieces of American music. And it's an, a special, um, has a very special sound in a reverberant place like this. Um, so Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring.